The following program is a Nightingale Conant production for Simon & Schuster Audio. I have a very strong belief that everything that comes into your life is supposed to, and every condition of your life is part of the perfection of it, and that there's a blessing in all of it, and that there are no accidents, that it's a perfect, absolutely, totally perfect universe. And what Wayne Dyer says makes perfect sense. In You'll See It When You Believe It, you'll discover how to tap into the true power of your mind, power that can make your life better than ever. Are you looking for something more from your work? In You'll See It When You Believe It, Wayne tells about a practical way we can truly find bliss in our everyday worlds. Are you looking for more successful relationships? Here you'll learn how to get out in front of conflict, especially with those you care about the most. And you'll learn how to train yourself to concentrate on what's most important for a fulfilling life. And we don't want to have our minds occupied, particularly with worry and anxiety and stressful kinds of things. So you have to learn how to focus your mind, how to get focused, and keep yourself from creating those kinds of thoughts that are always impinging on your consciousness. Wayne Dyer has been focused on personal development for years, and the leaders in the field have recognized his astounding knowledge. Wayne is the 1987 recipient of the Toastmasters Golden Gavel Award, and he's a well-known author, philosopher, and social commentator with a Ph.D. in counseling psychology. You'll See It When You Believe It is based on Wayne's most recent book of the same title. This is his seventh book. His first, Your Erroneous Zones, was a runaway bestseller with more than 30 million copies in print worldwide. In this program, you'll be Wayne's personal guest at warm, intimate studio recordings where he speaks with you one-on-one -on -one about life-changing philosophies. And you'll be in the audience to share in the joy of a live session with Wayne. One of the first steps in learning to see it when you believe it is to get out of old comfort zones, zones that may be holding us back from being all we can be. In this first segment, Wayne tells just how important it is to challenge our personal boundaries. Many years ago, I was invited to speak at a convention, and the place was called Getting in Touch. It's now out of business. And I really didn't know much about it, and I was taking most of the speeches that came along at that time. And my secretary arranged the whole thing, and I flew out to California rented a car in San Francisco, and drove to a place way out in the woods. I mean, it took a couple of hours to get there. It was called Getting in Touch, and I had these directions. It was like, you turn left at this pine tree, and, <laughs> and you turn right when you see this big clump of bushes. And I kept going and going, and I think, what am I getting myself into? And it was a weekend deal. I was going to speak Friday night, and then Saturday, all day, and then Sunday morning. Well, I arrived there, and I checked in, and it was a beautiful place, but it turns out that it was a place for people who were learning how to be masseurs and masseuses. <laughs> I arrived for my Friday evening seminar, and, oh, maybe 75 or 80 people signed up for it. It was terrific. And I arrived and got myself all set, and I was going to be this Mr. Hotshot professional doctor and all of this stuff, and I was going to talk about your erroneous sounds. And I looked out at my audience, and half of the people didn't have any clothes on. <laughs> Well, I had written erroneous, and I thought maybe they thought I had written erogenous zones. <laughs> they thought it was about the hot spots on the body, and I wanted to tell them this is about the soft spots in your head, really. <laughs> so anyway, I talked. But while I was out there, that isn't the main point of it. There was a whole group of hot tubs out there, 13 or 14 of them. And they were all set at different temperatures. The ones at the center were right around body temperature, 90 to 100 degrees, and they were just sort of like nice, warm bath water, and you could get into them. Then if you move to the right, it got a little bit hotter, and a little bit further, and a little bit further, and all the way up to 160 degrees or so. And then to the left, they went down to uh, temperatures in the 80s and the 70s, and then in the 50s and the 40s, and then just above freezing. So there were 14 or so of these hot tubs. As I talked to the people and I got to know them, they were phenomenal people. They really were. It was a wonderful experience. It was all on the up and up. There was no hanky-panky or anything like that going on. It was just clothing optional. 
What I first did is I watched the people. When we were through with the seminars, they had the option of getting a massage or going into the hot tubs or going into the saunas, and it was a whole health-oriented, nutritional place and all of that. So you could do a lot of things. So I watched the people all day on Saturday, and all of the people would stay around their comfort zones. And their comfort zones were 90 to 100 degrees, that hot tub, or the one that's just a little bit warmer, or the one just a little bit cooler. And they would use those three. Nobody was going into the extremes, into the hot tubs on the far right or the hot tubs way down at the cold end. Finally, Sunday morning, I asked the people, why were you doing that? And they said, well, that's comfortable. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, that's one of the things that we all do too often, is we stay only with what is comfortable. We find a comfort zone for ourselves. We sort of set ourselves into it, and we snuggle in, and we let that just sort of nice, tepid, warm water flow by us. And we fail to experience the whole panorama of what life has to offer us because we're so consumed with just staying comfortable, with staying within our comfort zones. So I said to the people, I said, we're going to all, all of us, are going to experience everything that we have to experience here. Why not? It's available, it's here, and at least check it out. And as a result of checking it out, then you'll know, rather than just having some preconceived idea of what you can or can't do. And you may find a, a whole new range of experience for yourself. And so we moved from the hot ones to the little bit hotter, and we check it out. And it was amazing how easy it was to adjust to something new. You could get into those very hot tubs, and you could handle that. Then when you get out, you could experience what it felt like. You could see how your body reacted. You could see if you felt any different, the circulation in your body, how that affected it. And then you could move down into the colder ones. Before it was over, everyone, all 75 or 80 people, experienced the entire range of what was available for them. Well, the metaphor there is that we need to do more of that in our own lives. We need to get out of just what we are accustomed to, what we've grown up to believe are our limits, and to begin to see that those limitations that we place on ourselves in our zones of comfort are the very things that restrict us from moving beyond the place that we are at now, experiencing all kinds of new things for ourselves. You can take and apply this in virtually every area of a person's life. I have seen people, I've talked to people, and I've said to them, have you ever tried Mexican food? Ugh, ugh, I would never eat Mexican food. I just, you've never tried a taco? You've never even, no, I just don't eat stuff like that. I just I couldn't eat that. Why wouldn't you try? It just doesn't seem like it's something that you should eat. It looks more like something you should throw at, at a beach or something, but I just wouldn't eat that. Have you ever tried Chinese food? No, it looks like there's worms in there or something. I just can't, I can't take that. Have you ever tried Italian? No, and you find that their range of experience is really their comfort zone. So this is what they're used to, and this is what they have over. And life becomes, instead of an exciting adventure of all kinds of new and delightful experiences, it becomes one of just staying comfortable, just staying comfortable. I can remember one time we were driving across the country when I was promoting Euronia Zones with my wife and my daughter, who was nine years old at the time. And we got to Glacier National Park out in northern Idaho. There was a Lake McDonald there. And I had been thinking about comfort zones at that time, been lecturing about it and been writing about it. I was getting ready to write another book, Pulling Your Own Strings. I wanted to test myself. This lake, the temperature of the lake, I don't know what it was, but it looked like there could have been ice chips in there. <laughs> it was very, very cold. This is not called Glacier National Park because it's got saunas in it and heated pools. And the water was very, very cold. And people would go in and they'd stick their toe in, and then they'd go back out and thaw out. And I said to my wife, I'm going to swim across this lake. She said, no, she said, you can't do that. It's about a mile across the lake. Now, I'm a long-distance swimmer. Right now, I swim a mile every single day, or almost every day. I'd say six days a week. So swimming a long distance isn't a problem for me, and I've been doing this for years and years. Swimming in that temperature was something I had never experienced before, but I had a belief that while I was doing it, I didn't have to experience cold. It didn't have to be cold for me. I mean, cold to the extent that it had to be uncomfortable. It didn't have to be uncomfortable. I could go into that water and make it something that I could handle and not suffer through. But I would have to do that with my mind. I couldn't do that just with my body, because my body was going to react to what I was accustomed to. And I kept saying to myself, you are not going to be cold. This is going to be a wonderful experience for you. You're going to swim across Lake McDonald in Glacier National Park, and it's going to be true. And I dove right into the side of the water. It was in the summertime. And I started swimming, and I didn't ever, during the entire time, it took me maybe 40 minutes or so, ever experience any discomfort all the way across that lake. While everyone else was shivering, I noticed when they would go up to the edge of the lake that they would tense up and they would find themselves getting ready to be uncomfortable, getting ready to experience pain. And I had a different, I used my mind, my thoughts, 
which is what the whole thing is about, learning how to think properly in your life. And people who don't go beyond their limits are people who don't use their mind in constructive ways. I was going into the lake with the idea that I could do this, that it was going to be great. It was a challenge and that it was going to be exciting, and I knew that I could do it. And therefore, I didn't tense up, and my body didn't go into the rigid position that you go into when you expect things to be cold. And my body reacted the way my mind was training it to do it. And when I got out of the other side, I felt terrific. It was one of the most glorious experiences of my life to do that. Now, you don't have to go out and swim across Lake McDonald in order to actualize yourself as a human being. But what you can do is begin to look at how is my life governed by the trappings of what I have been trained to experience in my life all up until now. What are my comfort zones? Look at those comfort zones, whatever they are, in your relationships, in your business. The whole world opens up to you when you get outside of any zone of comfort that you're in and push yourself a little bit more. The amazing thing about what you find is that it's not nearly as risky and dangerous and difficult as you think it is in the next hot tub. I mean, nobody's in it. You know, there's an old saying that I've used often, and that is that it's never crowded along the extra mile. The extra mile. It's like when you hear people talk about go the extra mile. You start doing that and you'll find there's nobody out there with you. <laughs> that extra mile, you're all alone, you know? So that hot tub over there to the right or that one down there to the left, it isn't that you somehow have to get in there to prove that you can do it. It represents and symbolizes for you moving out of where you're comfortable because as soon as you do that, then you're opening up new vistas and more and more and more vistas open up to you. If you find yourself just staying the same way and defining yourself as, well, this is just the kind of person I am. I'm just sort of reserved, and this is how I behave, and this is how I conduct myself, and so on. Instead of that, what you do is you want to look beyond that. You want to say, all right, nothing human is alien to me. The entire range of human experience is available to me. Anything that any human being can do, has ever done, or ever will be able to do, I'm capable of doing. And viewing yourself that way and seeing that, then your zone of comfort becomes the whole expanse of human possibilities. That's what becomes available to you. But when you narrowly define yourself and stay with what is comfortable, whether it's in what you eat, how you relate to people, how much money you make, where you go on your vacations, every aspect of your life is affected by that kind of an attitude. Get out of your zones of comfort. This also applies to the emotional or mental side of your life. Most people go through their life saying, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> Show it to me, let me look at it, then I will believe in it. That's a very narrow way to look at life because it really restricts you to only being able to perceive and experience and live what you can see. And believe it or not, what you can see is a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of what's available to you. A different way of looking at that is, I'll see it when I believe it. That is, I am only seeing in my life, and always seeing in my life, what I choose to believe in. See, if you only will believe what you see, then how can you believe in thoughts? And why would you pay your electric bill? <laughs> you know, I mean, if you can't see it, and nobody can see electricity, then you shouldn't be paying that. And you certainly can't believe that you have a mind. Because you can't see your mind, you can't touch your mind, you can't feel it, you can't smell it. It's impervious to the senses. It's a higher part of you. But if you know that just because it's invisible, or just because it's not available to me through my senses, that that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, that it's all out there for me to experience, so that you'll begin to see miracles, for example, in your life, wonderful, phenomenal miracles, more and more of which have cropped up in my life in recent years since I've shifted around my attitude about it, you begin to not only expect them, but you'll see them as a regular part of your life because your consciousness has changed, because you've gotten out of that comfort zone of only looking at it with what they call your left brain or with your analytical side, with the side that needs to carve it all up and make it organized and make it neat and make it real clear and easy for us. That's that sort of left brain. But the right brain, which is our intuitive side, which is the creative side, the side of our whole mind and thinking and personality, which is unlimited, which allows us to have an imagination to be able to create within our own mind. That side is just as important. Both of those sides of us are very important. But if you only restrict yourself 
over here. You'll always continue to have very, very limited vision in your life because if you can't analyze it, if you can't put a formula on it, if you can't dissect it, if you can't insure it, if you can't put it away in a drawer someplace and get your hands on it, then it doesn't exist for you. And boy, does that take away a lot of the range of human experience. It's a great place that I'm speaking about. It's something very different than just being positive and just enjoying life and not being victimized by other people and thinking well of yourself and all of that. That's all fine and good, and those are almost elementary steps. It's much more of a, almost a spiritual message without the religion. It works like knowing that somehow you, who you are, this individual that has shown up here tonight, is someone who is much grander and much greater, much more divine, much more perfect, much more fantastic than just this form that you've showed up in. That who you are is something behind that form, something that you only live with yourself, that you can never share with anyone else. And that when you get it, it's like I live down in Boca Raton, Florida, with my wife and six children. And we have a swimming pool. There's a gate we had built so that the children, we have four children under the age of six and a little boy who will be a year old Sunday. <laughs> and then I have five girls to go with that little boy. <laughs> and at this swimming pool where we built this gate that goes out, you go out through the gate and you swim and all that and you come back into the house, the gate has got a spring on it and a slam shut and then the children can't open the gate again, obviously, so they can't go back out there and put their lives in jeopardy. Well, that's a metaphor for what has happened to me in my life in the last several years, in the last four or five years. It's like going through a gate, and there's no going back, and that gate is slammed shut behind me. And the things that used to be a part of my life, which are so much a part of so many people's lives and interfering with the quality of their lives, just aren't there for me anymore. I was in Redondo Beach, California, just the other day. And I was going to speak out there at a church in the evening to a large group. I had to rent a car, and I was driving through the town and looking for the Palos Verdes Hotel where I was assigned to stay. But I didn't know how to get there. And I had an idea of where it was, but I wasn't sure. And you've all been in that position, a tourist in a beach town looking for your place. You know, I had my turn signal on, and I had it on for a block or so, and then realized that it's two more blocks up. I took it off and waited and there was somebody behind me who was having a myocardial infarction over my behavior I mean he was just crazy insane angry I could hear it <laughs> I am blasting on his horn and so on and then I looked up into the mirror and I could see him pounding on the dashboard of his car in anger it's like ah, I'll you I'll put you and I wanted to stop the car you know <laughs> and get out and say, everything's going to be fine. This is all going to work out just right. Just, you know, I'm going to be turning in another few blocks and you can go on, your life's going to be fine. And I ask you, the people here tonight in this room, what do you think caused that? What do you think created that kind of reaction in this person where a stranger in a rented car that even says rented car on the back of it <laughs> could go to that level of hatred and anger over a simple behavior of another human being and a very normal behavior at that. What do you think caused that? You think it was me that caused that in him? You think it was my car, my behavior, my driving? It's none of that, see? That's really the only message that I have is that who you are is the result of how you choose to process your life in the world and how it's presented to you. And until you understand that, that nobody out there in this planet, in this universe, has the power, the control to make you be or think or act or behave or emote in any way other than the way that you choose. And that capacity for thinking, that capacity for thought, it's the thing that most of us think is the least important part of our consciousness. We don't pay that much attention to it. We pay attention to this. The 
packaging, the body. And we evaluate our life based upon what rules apply to the body. And the rules, or the laws, or whatever you want to call them, that apply to your body, to your form, are very, very different than the rules and laws, principles that apply to the other part of you, the invisible part of you, if you will. And tonight's talk is really about that part of you, which is where you live. There's a man named Bucky Fuller. I don't know how many of you have heard of Buckminster Fuller. Brilliant man. He died a couple of years ago in his 90s, who worked with me on the Hunger Project and our efforts to end world hunger around the globe. He was a mathematician and a philosopher. He's the inventor of the geodesic dome. Brilliant man. He almost committed suicide when he was 30 years old. He went right down to the act of actually buying a gun. <laughs> At the worst part of his life, made a decision that he could do something with this. He could turn it around and benefit from it. And he made major, major contributions. One of the things he said to me once, he said, Wayne, never forget that who you are the human being that you are, that 99% of who you are is invisible, untouchable, unsmellable, impervious to the senses, that this form that you live in represents only 1% of your humanity. And 99% of your humanity is something other than form whatever it is. And hopefully when we leave here tonight you'll have not only a grasp of that but perhaps some methods and ways of really living that, of really understanding that. The concept of form is a key word and a key notion and I want you to think about it a lot. F-O-R-M, form, and all the rules that apply to it. And as I'll come back to it many, many times tonight. Until you can go beyond the boundaries of form, you can never awaken. You can never really live the life that you're capable of living and create the miracles that you're capable of creating until you absolutely, truly get a hold of that humanity behind your form, whatever that may be, whatever it is, however you define it. Your body has limits to how fast it can go and how far it can go. They're expansive and grand. They're much greater than you've ever thought they were. There are boundaries in form. But in thought, in that invisible world that I'm talking about, there are no boundaries except what you choose to think. You can think anything. And anything that you can think is here already in the dimension of thought. It's already here. And once you begin to see that world and begin to see that that's really who you are, you're not just this form that you occupy, but you're something much grander, much more divine, much more phenomenal than that, your ability to think. Then you start saying, well, and I'm in a relationship with another person, and that person does that too. I'm going to stop relating to the people in my life, just my form to their form. I'm going to start getting behind their form to that divine intelligence that's there. What are they thinking? And how can I have a no-limit relationship with everybody in my life? Instead of relating to the place where there are limits, their bodies, their forms, their performance level, I'm going to relate to what's in back of that. What kind of attitudes do they have? How do they think? I'm going to look at that side of them. That's what Mother Teresa talks about in the streets of Calcutta. She sees God in every one of those starving children and the lepers. She sees the divineness that's there. She doesn't just relate to the form. She relates to who is that human being in back of that form. What is that divineness there? You don't have to be Mother Teresa in the streets of Calcutta catering to the most sorrowful among us. You can do that every place in your life. You can stop just seeing the world in terms of what you see and what you can get a hold of and start living in that invisible part and in back of that where divineness really resides. That's in all of us. Whoever you are, wherever you go in the world, every single human being you meet, whether it's a tribesman in Afghanistan whether it's a Sherpa guide in Nepal, whether it's a taxi driver in Tokyo, or a tribesman in New Guinea, or a salesman in Detroit, you share something with that person. What you share is what it's like to be human. We all share that with each other. And you know, and they know, what it's like to hurt inside, what it's like to feel lonely, what it's like to experience pain, or to experience exhilaration or happiness. We all, as human beings, and those are all thoughts, those all come from thought, 
we share thought together with all human beings. And if we remembered that, if we tuned into that part of people, whether we're running a business or a family or whatever, if we started relating to people there instead of just to their form, and when you see an angry person or you see a happy person, what you're looking at is what created that and what kind of thoughts do they have and relate to their thought, relate to the divineness in them, whoever they are, the whole world would be better and so would your business. It's understanding that no one is any better than anybody else in God's eyes. See, it doesn't matter what you call that universal intelligence. <laughs> the name doesn't matter. It's just as good a word as any in God's eyes and that universal intelligence that's permeating all form. All of the rest of it is just trappings. It doesn't really matter. When it gets right down to it, we all share humanity with each other. We're all part of the being called human being, each one of us. If there's a dimension called form, there's another dimension called thought. I call it thought. You can call it anything you want to. In philosophy, they call it the astral dimension. And the word disaster originates from this, to disassociate from the astral or from this invisible dimension of you. And as long as you disassociate from this and live only here, you will have disasters in your life because you won't believe that somehow the part of you that thinks, that is thought, that creates thought, is essentially what your humanity is. And most folks don't get that. They think that this is it. I'm getting a haircut last week, or two weeks ago, me. <laughs> she charges me $25 for a haircut, me. <laughs> She said, the 20 of it is a search fee. I said, all right, I accept. Okay, I can accept that. I understand, all right? But even five. I mean, you ever go to have somebody doing something and they don't have anything to do? You ever have a job where you got to do something, got to look busy, but you don't have anything to do, but you got to kill a half an hour? That's sort of what it is when I get a haircut. It's snip, 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 And you look and nothing. There's nothing. Not a thing there, okay? And she's going on and on doing that. And suddenly she's got these clippers, these electric things, you know? And she's cutting, and all of a sudden, she's got it in my ear. It's in my ear. I said, Deborah, what are you doing? You've got that electric thing in my ear, and it hurts. And I, she said, oh, Wayne, you probably didn't know this, but when you get into your 40s and so on, she said, you start growing ear hairs, you know, and you got some ear hairs in there, so I'm cutting them out. I said, what the hell is going on with my form? <laughs> you know, I got them falling out where I want them and growing. What do I want hair growing in my ear for? And in my nose, what do I need that for? I never had that before. But you got to know that this isn't who you are. <laughs> and once you know that, then you just sort of stand back and watch it do whatever it's got to do. <laughs> I see people who are suffering, and I see people who are struggling, and I see people who are unhappy, and I see people who are mad, and I see people who are full of stress and tension, and I want to say to them, there's no stress in the world. The world is absolutely just the way it's supposed to be. It's perfect, just as it is. And it's like getting that and understanding that, and your first temptation in that is to say, yes, but the people starving in Ethiopia, is that part of the perfection of it? Yes. Yes. And so is your desire to end it, part of that perfection. It's like you don't argue with it. Everything that is, is. Everything that's ever happened to you already has. You can understand that worry, for example, is nothing more than thought. And what is there to worry about? Worry, which is a consuming thing that creates what we call stress, which is just stressful thinking. What is it? Here's a good parable for you. Everything that you worry about, give it this thought. There ain't no use worrying about the things that you don't have control over. Right? Because if you don't have control over them, there's no sense in worrying about them. That makes sense, doesn't it? So I don't worry about the things I don't have control over. Now, 
There ain't no sense worrying about the things you have control over. Because if you have control over them, there ain't no sense in worrying about it. Now we've covered everything that it's possible to worry about. It's all thought. It's all thought. If you don't have control over it, worry is absurd. So you're going to worry about getting old? I mean, do you have control over that in form? Do you have control over what is happening there? If you don't have control over that, then my belief is that it doesn't matter. <laughs> It just doesn't make any difference because who I am is a consciousness that transcends all of that. What I want you to think about is what in the world would you ever want to occupy your mind with worry about or anything that doesn't serve you living the life that you want to live and understanding that you're never going to ever let anybody, any place who doesn't have love or harmony to offer you enter this dimension where you do all of your living. Maybe this dimension, but never this dimension. You see, if someone sends you hate and you react with hate, then you're acting at the lowest level it's possible to act at. If someone sends you hate and you react indifferently, you're sort of average. But if someone sends you hate or anger and you react with love, because that's what's inside and that's all you have to give away because that's how you choose to use that dimension that is in back of your form or suffusing your form then that is what you will start expecting and seeing in your world and it becomes a way of living where you are able to go beyond think of the prefix in the English language that means to soar above to go beyond to go past and you come up with the prefix trans to go beyond, to soar above. And think of the suffix that means the result or the experience of. If you don't know that, it's T-I-O-N with an article, A. Shun, T-I-O-N, the result or the experience of. You have a new word there on the board, transformation. The result or the experience of going beyond your form, leaving the boundaries that confine you here and only allowing what you want into that other dimension. And you know something? In this dimension of thought or astral or beyond, which is invisible, you can have all of your relationships in your life. You can meet people there where there are no limitations. You can meet every stranger that you ever meet in that dimension, no matter what they're sending out to you. Once you understand that thought, that what you think about expands. Now get this, it expands. So if you think about what is missing in your life, then that's what's gonna expand. I was a therapist for many, many years up in New York and Long Island. And people would come to me and they would wanna talk about their problems for an hour every week. And in the process of talking to me about their problem, they always talked about what was wrong. About how their husband was behaving this way, about how their children weren't doing what they wanted them to, about they didn't have enough money, and about the illness, and their mother was this way. And, their, and it was like their whole consciousness all the time was on what was missing, what was wrong, what was negative, what was unpleasant. That's what occupied this territory that I can't define that is invisible in their lives. Now you have to understand that when you do that, that is going to expand in your life. And there's a reason for that. There's a very important reason for that. Because what you think about expands into action, into form. It's just a matter of bringing it from here to here. And you choose what comes in here. You create all of this. Because thought starts with you. <laughs> you are the creator of thought. And therefore, you are the creator of life. And you are the very creator of what your form is going to experience. As the Sufis used to say, if you don't have a temple in your heart, you'll never find your heart in a temple. <laughs> It's having it in your heart, and that comes from thought. So what you think about is profoundly important in your life. Emerson said, you become what you think about all day long. Christ said, as you think, so shall ye be. All the spiritual masters who've ever come our way have always talked about, be careful what you think, <laughs> because it's going to expand into your life.
I'm just beginning to understand that what we think about is much more powerful than I'd ever given consideration to before in my life. And I'm beginning to get evidence for it. I'm beginning to see it as I look back on things. When I was a little boy, we had a Admiral television set in 1951. I was 11 years old. We were one of the few people in the neighborhood to have this little TV. I used to stay up late at night and watch The Tonight Show with Steve Allen on it. And I had this thought, and it was a very powerful thought. And the thought was that I would be on The Tonight Show. I just knew it. And I used to tell my brothers what I was going to talk about when I would be on The Tonight Show. I was only 11 or 12 years old. They were 13 and 15. And they'd say, oh, yeah, sure, you're always dreaming. You've always got... Well, I'd still stay up at night, and everybody else would go off to sleep. I'd be watching the show. I'd watch it every single night, all of his funny routines that he did and all the characters on it and everything. And I could see myself. I could picture myself sitting on the panel there and having him interview me or having him be there with me and all of that. That passed, and many, many things like that, though, in my life that I thought about. Well, the irony of ironies is that 1976, 25 years later, I'm the author of a book that is at the top of the bestseller list around the world, The Erroneous Zones. I'm invited to do The Tonight Show, and Shecky Green is the host that night. It was the very first time I ever did the show, out of 34 or 35 times. I was so excited. It was like a dream come true that I was going to be on The Tonight Show. And I'd already done several other big shows and all of that. This was really something big. There was a bank of phones outside the green room where you get dressed for the show. I decided to call my wife and family back home and tell them that I was going to be on and Shecky Green was going to be the host and so on. I went over to the phone, I picked up the phone, I called my wife and I was talking to her, and then on the phone next to me, in this bank of phones, Steve Allen. Steve Allen is standing there, talking on the phone to his wife. And I <laughs> take the phone receiver out of my hand <laughs> and telling my wife, I said, you're not going to believe this, but Steve Allen is standing here right next to me. And I take the phone out and reach it over <laughs> so that she can hear his voice, and he's talking to his wife, and he's looking at me like, who is this crazy guy? Well... It turns out that the very first guest on the show that night was Steve Allen. After all those years, and there I was sitting there talking to him. A lot of people label a situation like that as circumstances, you know, or just coincidence or just blind, random luck or whatever. I've come to know that there's no such thing in the universe, that what you think about expands, and that if you have a thought in your mind and you stay with that thought and you know it to be true, it's just a matter of bringing it into form. And if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to bring it into form, it's going to happen for you. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop it. And I don't think there's anything random about it. I just don't even believe in randomness at all. I think that everything in the universe is absolutely perfect at the tiniest subatomic level and at the largest level. I get on the elevator, and I'm on the 17th floor. I have an office on the 17th floor. And I get in the elevator, and a couple gets on on the 14th floor, the elevator opens, and they're complaining about a tax audit that they just went through and how wow, it awful it was, and that they took more money of us, and they're always doing that. And I'm standing in the back of the elevator. I do this all the time. It's like I stand there, and then I really stand back here. <laughs> Who I really am stand back here, so I watch myself. It's like when you talk to yourself. That's two people, isn't it? You talking to yourself. And then it's like, then you watch these other men. I'm standing there watching. They're looking at my form, and I'm back there looking at the whole scene. <laughs> I do this all the time. It's great. So I'm on the elevator, and this is just a couple weeks ago, and the elevator stops again on the ninth floor. <laughs> and another couple gets on, and I'm standing in the back watching the whole scene. It's a wonderful place to get to where you just sort of observe life and you're not in conflict with it and you sort of surrender to it. And you know it's all going to work and everything's going to be positive and so on. It was August and they're complaining about how hot it is in August. And oh, it's just on God, it's been ghastly. Oh, this whole time and another, another day we've got to go out in this heat. And I'm standing listening to this and there's the audit over here and there's the heat over here. Then we get to the fourth floor and uh, another couple gets on. And they're complaining about how many stops the elevator's making today. <laughs> it's true. So they're like, oh, damn elevator, it's always stopping. And it's, uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> so I'm standing in the back watching this whole scene playing out in front of me, thinking to myself, I never do this. I used to do this, but I never do this anymore. And you may say, well, what is it that you don't do? <laughs> what I don't do is ever find it possible for myself to think about things that I don't like or that are missing 
or that are miserable or that I find distasteful because I somehow have got in my consciousness an understanding that when you do that, that's what expands in your life and that really successful people only see things working out. <laughs> And they understand that, they get that, they hold on to that, and they get that picture of it. Like, I can't get a picture before going out to speak of an audience who's not going to like me. Because I know that's going to expand. And I'll walk out and go, and that'll be the end of it. All right, it'll be done. I know that it's going to be great, and it's going to be terrific, and it's going to be fun. If I keep that consciousness inside of me, that I'll expand that into action. So now you have to do is look at all of the stuff that's going on in your life. And how much of it is a result of, you'll see it when you believe it, of seeing what you're thinking about. Now, when my kids go to sleep at night, I never tell them if they got a little sniffle, this is going to be worse tomorrow, you're going to have to take off school. I wouldn't want to program them with anything like that. I always tell them how strong they are, how terrific they are. This thing's going to be gone in the morning, and you'll be off to school, and it's going to be great. I want them to be able to expand into form, thought, that they want rather than the other way around and people who are chronic complainers never seem to be able to get past that and everything that they think about keeps coming up and the tragedies keep multiplying and the horrible things keep coming into their lives and it's like that becomes a part of your consciousness in an energy system where thought is the energy or the current what you think about expands into action it's like getting old you know, it's like I tell people, don't let an old person move into your form. <laughs> don't let an old person in. Don't let an old person move in. The age of your form isn't who you are. Who you are is thought, and thought is ageless. You can't age thought. Age is universal and eternal. It goes forever. It's what the universe is. So you don't let that person who walks slow and talks slow and thinks slow, you don't let that person in. In reading the literature of the East particularly, in preparation for my book, You'll See It When You Believe It, I would find that over and over, I would see references to this thing called the observer. I'd say the observer. And one particular group of people would have written about it, and then it would show up in Buddhism, and it would show up in Hinduism, and it would show up in practice of Zen and in Kundalini. And it just kept showing up, this observer, the observer. And I wasn't quite sure what it was, what it meant. And then I began to realize that it's something I've done all my life, only they were just putting it into words. It's really a technique that I find myself using over and over again. The best way to think of it is, like Shakespeare said, the whole world is a stage, and we are all but actors on that stage. When you start to look at it that way, you begin to see yourself as having a lot of roles to play. And they really are roles. And we're all out there playing these roles. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not authentic at all. I'm not talking about authenticity. Each one of these things are very real, but they are still roles that we're playing. So what you have to do is sort of remind yourself that you're doing that and not take all of this whole stage so seriously and make it so dramatic and so significant and important. It's like lightening you up a little bit. And the observer is like whoever this guardian angel or this invisible person is. You can sort of catch yourself whenever you find yourself getting out of control or getting mad at the fact that there's a delay at the airport or that the traffic isn't going the way you want it to, that invisible guardian angel, that I, that can be in back of you, can put the skids on that right away. That person can say, I'm watching you. I'm watching your form. You know, Lily Tomlin had a great line. She said, how come when you talk to God, it's called praying? But when God talks to you, it's called schizophrenia, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but that God talking to you can be that invisible part of you. Then you start connecting to that. And I find myself, wherever I am in my life, whatever I'm doing, in back of myself, on my shoulder or whatever, and reminding me, how should you react to this? Send love here. On an airplane not too long ago, there was a little lady about four foot ten, and she had gotten on the plane first, and she got about halfway down the aisle, and she couldn't get her stuff. <laughs> 
She had a handbag and so she couldn't reach the upper bin. She was standing on the seat and all this, and I was right behind her. All of the people in back of me were all grumbling about this lady and how rude she was being and how terrible and how can you behave this way? And if you're going to take so long, then you should have got on last. It's like their observer was telling them to act nasty or they weren't paying attention to that. And I was saying, what can I do here? Where there was a time when I would have thought, Get out of the way, lady. Come on, I got to get to my seat. And you're holding up everybody. And all. I didn't do that. I stopped. I said, here, you know, I'm six foot one. I can do this for you. And I put that up and I did this. And I said, here, have a nice day. And I had a book with me and I signed it and I gave it to her. And she was happy. And that was the observer. <laughs> In order to make this technique work for you, and all of us have that capacity to do it, as I've just illustrated, what you have to do is first become aware of what you're doing to yourself. That if you're into that hurry up, type A, got to get there fast, everything has got to get done yesterday kind of mentality, then there's still something that is making you do that. It may be very instantaneous or what some people would call subconscious, which I don't like to call it that because if it's below your consciousness, then you're not aware of it anyway. So, you know, why call it that? And that's just a cop out. It's an instantaneous reaction through a lot of training to how you have to live your life. So what you do is you catch yourself. In the moments like I just described on the airplane, or in any moment, when you find yourself reacting in a way that you know isn't good for you, isn't working for you, isn't healthy, as soon as you see that, you don't need a doctor to tell you that worrying a lot about a lot of things is going to create an ulcer for you. It's going to make you feel tight inside. Your body reacts to thoughts. And the thought of, I've got to get there fast, and I've got to get around this traffic, and it shouldn't be this way, and I've got to get that done, gives you cramps. You notice that your heart, your pulse rate is going much faster, or you're twitching, or you're sweating. Those are all signals to you. Don't do that. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to go to a physician and go to therapy to find that out. Stop doing that. Look in the mirror if you're all flushed and bloated and sick or gulping down antacids. Whatever it is in order for you to get through your days, you know that that isn't working for you, that your life isn't... So get an observer <laughs> and get that observer to catch you and say, wait a minute, I'm your buddy. <laughs> That's who I am. I'm with you. I'm going to get in harmony with that part of me. And I'm going to allow that observer to do more of the directing and watch out for the roles that I'm playing. And whatever role I'm playing that isn't working and providing me with the joy and the success and the happiness that I really believe I'm entitled to... I'm going to have that observer catch me at that and stop me from behaving in that way. It really is a tool to help you to be more realistic, more tuned in in life. For me, it is a reminder that there's much grander things than what I've just become accustomed to. I'll give you an example on the tennis court. My doubles partner made a bad shot, and he screamed something out, called himself a name. He said, ah, you jerk, you dummy. He was talking to himself. And I stopped and I said, Lenny, I really don't appreciate it when somebody calls my partner a jerk and a dummy. I said, who was that? Who was doing that? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, whoever it is that's calling my partner a jerk and a dummy, I'd like you to get in touch with him and remind him that he's a beautiful guy and he just didn't hit the shot the way he wanted to. I'd like you to tell that person that. It's like a reminder that when you call yourself a name, you know, you got two people going here. <laughs> you got the person who's the recipient, the jerk, and you got the person doing the calling. Well, you want to get those two in balance. You want to get those two in harmony. You want that person, whoever that is, that is saying, you jerk, to say, you're allowed to make an error in tennis. You have to do it. Nobody goes through a whole match without making errors. And that it's okay. And that you forgive yourself and you're kind to yourself. And then the recipient of that is in balance so that those two people, quote, or those two parts of you are in harmony. Because if the part of you that's calling you a jerk, if the recipient of that begins to believe that, then you start acting on what you hear and what you believe. And pretty soon, everything that you say to yourself, if you call yourself a jerk enough, you're going to think that you're a jerk. And that's one of the problems with self-esteem. It's people who have really talked to themselves in such a way that the self and the I, which we've separated, they become the same. And so the person who's doing the calling believes that they're a jerk, and the person who's the recipient believes it. And if they had an observer <laughs> there, if that I who was doing that instead was saying, you know, you're pretty terrific. You, know, you make some mistakes. All of us do, but that doesn't mean that you're bad and that you're not any good. And you get those two in harmony so that you are never calling yourself anything but what you would like to be.
And the more you do that, the more that you'll be in harmony. And that's all invisible. I tell people, supposing you went to sleep and you had a dream, and in your dream you had, oh, all these different characters, and you had all of this money, and you had everything that you wanted in your dream. And then you woke up, and then you look back at your dream, and you became attached to the stuff that you had in your dream. Wait a minute, I want that. There was gold in there. There was silver. There was all of these friends. There was cars. I had a Ferrari. I got to have that. Somebody would cart you off and put you in a rubber room and say, that was a dream. You can't be attached to that. That's just a thought that you have. That's the way you got to view life. Instead of it being an eight-hour dream, it's an 80-year dream or a 90-year dream. And at the end of the dream, you don't want to be looking back at all of the stuff that you wish you could still have because you can't have it. <laughs> you don't get any of that. So you try to detach yourself now while you're here, while you're alive, from the need to have that stuff. Instead, you just let it sort of all flow. As absurd as it would be for you to be attached to the stuff that you had in your dream, it's that absurd for you to be attached to the stuff that you're having in this dream. <laughs> you have to die while you're alive. Now, that's a very hard concept for people to get. You have to experience your own death while you're alive. Let me tell you a story. It's a wonderful story. It's an old, ancient story. I'll paraphrase it. There was a hunter who lived in India, and he would go to Africa every two years, and he would bring back animals and prizes and things like that. Well, one year he took off, and he went to the jungle, and he discovered this large enclave inside the jungle, and it was filled with beautiful parrots, beautiful birds, multicolored, and they all talked. And he couldn't get over it. And he put a net out over one of the trees, and he captured one of the parrots, and he put the parrot in a cage. And he brought the parrot back to be with him in India as his pet. And he fed the parrot sunflower seeds, and he fed him rice, and he took wonderful care of him. He was very good. Kept him in the cage. Two years went by, and he talked to the parrot every day. And he said to the parrot, I'm now going back to Africa. Is there anything you would like me to say to your friends back there in the jungle when I'm back there? The parrot said, yes. Tell them that I'm very happy in my cage. Tell them that I'm joyful and that I love being in my cage here with you. Just tell them that. The hunter went back to Africa, he went back to the place in the jungle where he had been two years before, and he told the story. He said, your friend that I took back has a message for you. And the message is that he is happy in his cage, that he is joyful with me, and that he has no regrets. At the instant of hearing that, a bird on one of the branches keeled over and dropped dead. Dropped dead, stiff. The hunter assumed that he was just filled with sorrow at hearing of what had happened to his friend. So he went back to India, and he told his parrot what had happened. He said, I went back and I did just as you said. And I told them all out there. And at the moment that I told it, apparently one of the parrots was so upset that he'd missed you so much that he just dropped dead. And at the instant that that happened, the parrot in the cage keeled over dead. His legs went straight up in the air, and he went stiff. The hunter was beside himself. He couldn't figure out how could this happen. And he took the dead parrot out of the cage, opened it up, and threw it out on the woodpile. The instant that the parrot landed on the woodpile, he flew up to the branch. And the hunter said, you tricked me. What is this? I thought you were dead. And the parrot said, my friend back in the jungle was sending me a message. He told me, by his actions, that in order for you to escape from your cage, you must die while you're alive. Okay, now that's an old story. That's an ancient story that's been told over the years. What does it mean? <laughs> I mean, don't you see that this is a cage? The whole planet is a cage. If you can just stand back far enough and see that we're still restricted by the limitations placed on us as human beings. We're stuck here, or maybe in our homes, or in wherever we are. We're all in cages. And even though we have more room to manipulate, we may even have a whole planet. We're still sort of in cages. Now, how do you escape from the cage that you're in? You have to die 
while you're alive. You have to literally experience your own death. All of us have to. All of us are going to die. So why not experience it in advance and see yourself out of your body, gone, but able to look back at what's going on now, just like the dream, where you have the dream and you have everything you want, but you're able to look back at it. As you do that, you begin to see the folly, the absurdity of hanging on to anything, of being attached to anything, of needing anything, of telling yourself that I can't be happy if, from the perspective of having died, but being able to look back on it, just like the dream. As soon as you can do that, as soon as you can experience yourself formless, dimensionless, form and all of the attendant things that you hang on to become irrelevant. They're not necessary any longer. You have a whole new way of living, a new way of being. I have a very strong belief that everything that comes into your life is supposed to, and every condition of your life is part of the perfection of it, and that there's a blessing in all of it, and that there are no accidents, that it's a perfect, absolutely, totally perfect universe. Everybody that you meet, you meet for a reason. Everybody you're sitting next to, you're there for a reason. You can either take advantage of it or not. You have choices to make throughout it all. At the same moment, there's an opportunity in it. And I never look back with anything but gratitude for all that was handed to me. Because I learned firsthand as a very young boy how to be self-reliant how to take responsibility for myself, how not to blame other people for it, and to find something positive in it, and always did. So that that little old lady who's driving in front of you at 20 miles an hour with the 1976 Cadillac, cream-colored, you all see her, she's everywhere. <laughs> she's got blue hair, and she can hardly see over the steering wheel. And she signed an oath <laughs> that she will drive aimlessly around, you know. <laughs> testing your ability to deal effectively with her. You know, she's like a test. She's like a gift from God <laughs> to test. And it's like once you stop being mad at her for being who she is and what she is and what she's about, when you stop the anger and the bitterness at who she is and understand that she's exactly where she's supposed to be. And she's there to teach you a very important lesson. Slow down. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> Relax. Don't give her control over the divine part of you. The intelligence in back of that is suffusing your form, invisible as it is, it's still there and it's yours. It's really what constitutes your entire humanity. Don't give it away. Think of yourself as connected to and a part of it all rather than someone who is being victimized or slowed down or abused by or here it happens again. It's all part of the perfection of it all. That's a very nice, enlightening place to get to. It really slows you down. And it doesn't take away your ability to make choices. It takes away your wanting the world to be as you think it should be instead of as it is. That's what defines neurotic. <laughs> That's what neurotic really means. <laughs> to be wanting the world to be as you are rather than as it is. And for you to process it exactly the way it is. And if you see everybody as a teacher, then you ask yourself, what do I have to learn here? And it's like in that second that you're just about to be angry and go around and maybe even have a head-on collision or whatever, or maybe nothing, but still in a hurry, maybe at that moment that person is there. That person is there to teach you to slow down a little bit. They used to say to scientists, are you a scientist? And the scientists would say yes. And they'd say, well, do you believe in spirituality? Do you believe in God? And they'd say, no, I'm a scientist. <laughs> now, today... In the 1990s, you ask a scientist, do you believe in God? And they say, of course, I'm a scientist. <laughs> Science is beginning to prove what metaphysics has been saying for centuries. That when you study life at the tiniest subatomic level, the tiniest, tiniest level, that all of the particles seem to be on purpose and be, they're all interconnected in some mysterious way, and they're all sort of controlled by some force outside, some mystical thing, and they're all on purpose, and there's nothing random about any of it. That's all the new literature is coming out. There's nothing random, nothing happenstance in the universe. I find that so intriguing. If every subatomic particle <laughs> is on purpose, and we're made out of those, <laughs> then why not us? And when I see all of those people coming out of the, like when I was on Wall Street one day in New York, and I don't know if you've ever been there, at 5 o'clock you go to Wall Street, and you watch 
thousands, millions of people. They're coming from underneath the ground. And they look like all these ants. Like an anthill. There's just millions of people coming out from underneath the ground <laughs> on all these little openings on all the streets and the subways. And they're all going someplace or they're all going down into the ground, you know, at 5 o'clock. And I look at them now and I think they're all on purpose. They're all like those subatomic particles. They appear random to us because we're so limited in our vision. We tend to view everything from the limited perspective of our form. When you know that they're all on purpose, it stops you. You know, you see that little old lady driving slow. You say, well, she's doing just exactly what she's supposed to be doing. She's right where she belongs. And you stop judging it and analyzing it. When you have lunch tomorrow, have a salad. <laughs> and when you have your salad, take that piece of lettuce and put it in your mouth and chew it up. And as you chew it up, notice that something happens in your mouth, something called salivation. Saliva enters your mouth. Do you get up in the morning and say to yourself, oh, God, here we go again. I have to salivate again today. I'm so tired of this. Why me? Why every day? Salivate, salivate, salivate. It's all this. Oh, if I could just have... You don't do that, do you? Salivation, not salvation, <laughs> salivation is a principle that you are born into. And it works independent of your opinion about it. It doesn't care. When you start chewing up the lettuce, you have to swallow the lettuce, don't you? You don't say to yourself, I got to get the lettuce from here down to here. Does it ever go up? Do you ever go and it's up here someplace? Never. There's a principle within you, this you that you are here, called peristalsis, which makes the muscles go down. There's a muscle movement that makes it go down rather than up. First I got to salivate, now I got a peristalsis. Ugh, this is so depressing. You don't do that. Peristalsis is a principle that the I that is we, called you, is born into. And then you have to distribute that lettuce, mulch, throughout your entire system. You've got to get some of it to your liver, and some of it's got to go to your armpit, some has got to go to your heart, some has got to go to your eye. <laughs> you don't concern yourself with whether it's going to all go to the right... But miraculously, perfectly, somehow, the lettuce gets converted to the right nutrients all over your body. A principle, cardiovascular pulmonation. How many are sitting there right now beating their hearts? <laughs> you got to do it 14,000 times every day. Are you doing that? Do you worry about that? Do you concern yourself? No. Your heartbeat is a principle that you were born into. If you can accept that and know that there are principles operating within you that allow you to function perfectly because you've surrendered to them, you don't think about them, is it so difficult to grasp that there are also principles in this larger body called humanity of which you are a part as well? Because at the same moment that you are a single heartbeat in the body called humanity, you are also one beating heart. The earliest stage of enlightenment is called enlightenment through hindsight. You know, like when you're in a relationship and you're breaking up, is there anybody here who hasn't broken up <laughs> once and struggled and cried and been in pain and, oh, I can't stop thinking about it. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's just, it's this endless pain and your mind is on suffering, suffering, suffering. And what expands? Suffering, suffering. It just keeps expanding and expanding. You can't get your mind off of that person and where I'd like it to be. And finally, finally, three, four, five, 
five, six years go by and you finally passed it in one way or another and then you look back on it and you see why you had to go through it. So the lowest stage of enlightenment is that stage where you look back on your life and you say, now I know why I had to be an alcoholic for those years. And now I know why I had to be in that relationship with my ex-wife. And now I know why I had to go through the bankruptcy. Or now I know why I had to create that cancer. Or that heart attack. Or whatever it was that taught me how to transcend that self-defeating behavior that I used to think I couldn't do anything about. <laughs> you see? The second stage of enlightenment is when things like this are happening to you you know there's a blessing in it. There's an opportunity in it while it's happening. You're smoking and you know that there's something in this for me. You're going through a relationship difficulty or you're having an accident or you've gone through a series of illnesses. Whatever it may be that seems to be a struggle for you in your life, while it's happening, you're looking constantly for the what's in it for me. What can I get out of this? There's no mistakes out there. It's all being created for some reason. So that's the second stage. And that minimizes the suffering. Because you're looking for what's in it for you. How can I get something out of that? So that the person cutting you off, the way your children talk, whatever, you're not instantly threatened by that. You're constantly aware that these people are behaving that when there's something in this for me to learn. And I think I'll get it now. I think I'll get it now. Instead of waiting six years suffering through it and then seeing it. But there's a higher stage. It's the highest stage. In Zen they call it, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. It's the same. The only difference is that you're doing it from a totally new perspective of thought. And this dimension, the highest stage, what enlightenment really is, it's when you're back home again, instead of pulling away from yourself, you're toward yourself, and this is what it is. You are able to get out in front of it, play it out in the dimension of thought, and decide for yourself whether it's even necessary to bring it into form. It's like you're out in front of yourself. You're in a relationship. My wife will say something to me. And I know that if I respond in a certain way, if I say this, then she's going to say that. And it's like, then she's going to say that, then I'm going to say that. And then, and I can play that all out in thought. I'm out in front of this already, okay? This was at one time a guaranteed absolute blowout. Anger over nothing, fear perhaps of intimacy, who knows, whatever. But it was guaranteed to be angry and PO'd for two or three days. Her and me. Maybe no talking, maybe storming out, maybe any number of things that people do over silly things to avoid being intimate, usually. So I play that all out, and I don't have to go there. I don't have to do that any longer. I don't have to make her wrong, which is a great step. I don't have to make me right, an even higher step. There's no right or wrong in it. And I play the whole thing out. And as I play the whole thing out, I decide I don't have to bring this into form. I got out in front of it. It's gone. It's all been played out in my mind. Right? You use your mind to not bring into form, into your life, into action, that which you know is going to take you down a place that's backward. <laughs> I amusingly tell people that this is a wonderful stage to get to because you can still, once you're both there, you can still get your point across. I was in the shower and I was thinking about this. <laughs> I was in the shower. It's one of those showers that has a handle that you turn a certain way, all right, now, my wife is about a foot shorter than I am, so she turns the handle a certain way, and the water will go on her the way she likes it, and then she leaves the shower. Then I go in the shower, and I turn the shower on, and my kneecaps are getting a shower, okay? So now I have to reach up, and I, you know, I have to adjust the whole thing. So it's like a little game. I'm thinking to myself, I'm playing it all out in form. I think, now, if I say something to her about this, then she's going to say, you know, what right do you have to say? And then I'm going to say back to her. And then she's going to... And this could end up being a stupid fight. An angry evening or whatever over the position of a shower head. So I don't do that. 
I play it all out in form, I move the shower, and I have my shower. Then I go tell my wife. But I don't tell her about how she put the shower. I tell her, you know, I am so advanced. I am so enlightened. This is so great. Getting on this path is so great. And the fact that you're on it, too. Like, we don't even have to ever fight anymore about these dumb things. She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, I thought that you leaving the shower head in the position that you normally leave it really sort of interferes with And then I thought, well, if I tell you that, then you're going to have to come back and say what you do. And then I'm going to have to go back and tell you. And then you're going to, and then we're going to have this stupid fight. And then we're not going to be happy. And I'm holding her all this time. And I'm even kissing her while I'm telling her that, you know, I said, but isn't it great that I don't have to go there anymore. And I can play it all out in thought and it's all done. And she said, didn't you just tell me about where the shower head was? I said, yeah, isn't that great that you don't have to react to what you did? <laughs> now you put the shower head where it belongs. In. <laughs> and it's like a joke, you know? So it's like you can talk about your enlightenment and get your point across without even having to have it be an unpleasant exchange. <laughs> you go from being the actor in your life who is being directed by the events, the circumstances, and the other people in your life to being the director at the second stage. And in the third stage, you become the producer of your life. So you are now the actor, the director, and the producer of your entire life. And you're doing it all with your mind, all with your thought. So if it's a job move, you would have agonized over that. You can see how it's going to go. If you're living in Atlanta and you've got to go to Houston, you can see yourself in Houston. And you can see yourself selling your home and driving to Houston and starting this new job or starting out this new enterprise. You can play this all out. You can do the whole thing. And you can actually literally see how it's going to work because what you think about expands. And then you can decide. You can decide not based upon, oh, my boss is going to do this to me and the world is going to do this. And if these things don't work out, you can do it based upon your projecting in your mind exactly the way you want it to be. And if the picture doesn't come out the way you want it to be, then you're out in front of it already, and you don't move. Or you do, because you see it as an exciting, wonderful adventure and a time to do something new. You can do this with anything that is coming at you, which you perceive to be coming at you, but which is really, in effect, what you're creating through all of the choices that you're making. You can start using your mind in exciting ways. Before I give a speech, I play the whole thing out in advance in my mind. I don't play the speech out. I play what the reaction is going to be and what an impact I'm going to make. I do it when I record these tapes. I go through it in my mind, not what I'm going to say, what examples I'm going to use and all of that. I let that come spontaneously. I've surrendered. I know that that's going to work out. If I play it out in my mind and it says, I don't want to go to Chicago and I don't want to have to sit in a recording studio and I don't want to have to talk about it, then I don't have to do that either. You know, it's like you're producing it all. You're creating your whole life. And you can even do that in situations where most people are bothered in business, not just in their families. You begin to see how if you react in a certain way towards your superior or towards somebody that works for you or your coworker or whatever, you begin to know that if I act this way or say this or do this, that that's going to set them off or that they're going to, you know, and I don't have to go there anymore. I don't have to be a participant in their dream of being set off. So I don't go there anymore. And instead of behaving this A, B, C, and D, I've already done that in my mind, and I've seen the result. I don't want my form to have to follow that anymore. I'm in front of it. It's like you're producing your life through your mind. I think we show up here with a mission. We have tasks. We have lessons. We have things that we have to do while we're here. And for some of us, that's a very short time. And for some, it's a very long time. And some people will have 30 years' experience. And some people will have one year experience 30 times, <laughs> two different approaches, endlessly keep repeating the same thing over again, and others are growing. It's not the same for anybody. I just talked to somebody just the other day who's got 29 years working at a plant in Indiana. His real love is he has an apple orchard. He has 290 trees. He knew so much about apples and about all the different kinds of apples and all the controversy about pesticides and why they have to be used and which ones are safe and which ones aren't and how much water that you have to give them and why you just let nature do it in a certain way and where you plant them and when you harvest them. And he had this whole thing he had discovered about how to keep apples for six months by putting them in your refrigerator and keeping them cool, but you've got to keep moisture in there. He said the moisture goes out and he was so excited about his apples. <laughs> and yet he spends... 99% of his life doing something that he doesn't like doing. I said, your bliss is your apples, isn't it? And your apple orchard. Oh, he said, I love it when I'm out there with that. I just feel like I'm with God at that time. 
I said, is there any way to make this so you don't have to do this other stuff? So that you don't have to spend your life in this sort of inauthentic way where you're always thinking about how much you dislike what you're doing? Well, I've never thought about really making a living at it and all of that. I said, somebody's got to buy apples, and there's applesauce that's got to be made, and there's apple pies that have got to be made. and there's, It's like if you get your bliss, if you know what it is, then it's just a matter of taking some of the risks that go with it. And why not? Why restrict yourself in any way? What I was suggesting to him was, like, give yourself a chance at that. There's two things that I think about what you're doing. You've got to love what you do, and you've got to do what you love. Everybody can do this, and I don't really think... It matters too much what you're doing. But if you don't like it, you have options. The first option that you have is that you can leave it and take the risk that goes with following your bliss. And I know what your question is already. <laughs> How do I know what my bliss is? Now, I'll come to that. So what you do know is what it isn't. <laughs> we always know what it isn't. <laughs> For sure, that's no problem. But you can leave what you're doing. That's number one. Or you can change around your thoughts, the 99% of who you are, about what it is that you're doing. You have that option. You can decide that if you just are not willing to take the risk or you have to stay with this or whatever, that I can change my thoughts toward it. And I can make it as creative and do all kinds of things with it and say, all right, I'm only going to do this for six hours or eight hours in a day, and then I'm going to get right out into my apple orchards. And, I can... and this is sort of what this fellow was doing, was learning how to go into this assembly line job that he had and do it and not have such a negative, terrible attitude about it and have fun with it and make it blissful. So you can change. There's risks involved with all of that for some people. I think that the risks are much less than most of us realize. They're not really risks at all after a while. They're just like adventures and their excitement. And the people who really love you and support you in your life will support you trying new things. And you begin to find out that you can live with a lot less and that as long as you have joy inside of you, telling yourself that you have to have a lot of stuff and a lot of accumulations and a lot of that in order to live happily is really a myth for most of us. But how do you find your bliss then? To come back to that question. The answer to that is you don't. You have to let your bliss find you. And your bliss can't find you. <laughs> it sounds strange, but your bliss cannot find you. It's like your purpose. It cannot find you as long as you're filled up or clogged up with something else. Here's a wonderful story. There was an expert on Buddhism and Far Eastern religions. And he was a professor at a university. He had written four or five books on the subject. And he was really considered a true expert. But he had always wanted to meet a particular Zen saint who lived in India, up near Nepal. And so he traveled there with all of his books. He wanted to meet this particular Zen saint, a guru. He had made an appointment, and he introduced himself, and the man had just like a loincloth on, and he was very simple, very peaceful, very old. So you get the picture. And the expert began talking to him about all the things that he knew about Zen and Buddhism and so on. And the master stopped him and said, would you like a cup of tea? And he said, yes, that would be very nice. And he took a teacup and he put it in a saucer. And the man continued to talk about all of the things that he knew about. And the master picked up the tea and he began to pour it into the cup. And the man continued talking. And then the cup was full and the master continued to pour. And the tea poured out of the cup and onto the saucer. And as the man talked, he still kept pouring. And the tea was now going onto the floor and onto the man's pants. And finally, he stopped him and he said, Excuse me, but the cup is full. You're pouring, you know, and it's full. And the master stopped him and said, You are like the cup. He said, You are so full of everything that you know that you don't have room to let anything else new in. And so many of us are just like that teacup. We're so full of all of the stuff that we have learned that there's no more room <laughs> to let anything else in. It's just all pouring out and just going past us and all outside of us. Now, if you can see that metaphor in yourself, you can begin to see that in the eyes of the beginner, there are millions of options. In the eyes of the expert, there are only one or two. So the suggestion to finding your bliss is to always be a beginner on the path. Never become an expert. If you're going to go out and learn tennis and you've never played it before and someone hands you a racket 
And they say, now, try a drop shot this way. You are open. <laughs> you are willing. I'll do that. Now hit a forehand this way. Now, well, try it this way if you move over here. And now try The beginner has a thousand options available to them and will try everything. But if you talk to an expert about how to hit a backhand, they only know one way. <laughs> now, that's true not just in tennis. That's true in your business. That's true in your relationships. That's true in everything in your life. Stay a beginner <laughs> along the path. You can get clogged up, so clogged up with what you know and with the negativity that goes with that and all the rejection, all the judgment that goes with that because you have to reject all kinds of other points of view in order to make sure that yours is the only one that ever gets heard or ever gets used, that you don't have any room inside of you for something new and something exciting and something different and expanding yourself and so on. So be wary of experts, especially if you're one yourself. Be wary of yourself becoming one, because then you limit yourself. And by limiting yourself, your bliss, your purpose, which is there, can't find you. It's like an artery that's clogged up with cholesterol. Nothing can flow through it because it's too clogged. You've got to unclog yourself. And the way you unclog yourself is by opening yourself up and advancing confidently and doing things that make sense to you, that make you feel good, that are of service to others, that are useful to other people, whatever it is that you're doing. The idea of having a quiet mind. When I first started practicing meditating, which I encourage people to do, not from any Far Eastern guru loincloth kind of thing at all, but as a way of understanding that there's another dimension. If I were to take you, the listener, and to put you in chains, and to put you in a dungeon, and to deny you light and human contact for the rest of your life, you would probably say to yourself, this is the end. I mean, this is the end. I can't handle this. There are some people, believe it or not, among us, who, if you were to do that, very same thing, would say, this is a beginning. <laughs> There's a whole world there. If any of us were forced to learn how to go into that world, we would discover many, many, many things about ourselves. And I'm talking about the world of the mind. It's not an accident that all of the great spiritual masters have encouraged a kind of meditation of one kind or another, and that most advanced people, most awakened people, practice it on a regular basis. It's not an accident. You begin to discover how slimy your mind is. <laughs> the thoughts that you have all the time and how much disasterizing we do with our minds and how much stuff that we occupy our minds with that is so unnecessary and so silly, so foolish, so destructive, that quieting our mind and meditating really go hand in hand. Now, meditating doesn't require a lot of training. It doesn't require somebody teaching you exactly how to do it or whatever, because that defeats the purpose of meditating. When you meditate, you really want to go in there and quiet your mind. And what you want to be able to do in your life is to have an open, but not a rampage going on inside of your mind, not a thousand thoughts barraging it. And these thoughts that you have, these are yours. These are your creation. I used to tell people as a therapist, if you don't believe that you're in control of your thoughts, then I want you to tell me who is. <laughs> then I want you to find all those people who are in control of your thoughts and send them all to me. Then I will treat them, and you will get better, <laughs> which is absurd. Obviously, you're not going to get better by treating somebody else. You are the creator of thought, which means that in some metaphysical way, you're the creator of your life. Thought originates with each one of us, but most of us have trained ourselves to believe that whatever we think just sort of happens and thoughts just sort of I call it the pop-in theory, you know? They just sort of pop in, and I can't help it. Boop, there's a thought, and it's just there. And I can't help it, it just happened. That isn't true when you train your mind. We spend so much of our energy training ourselves in all kinds of areas. We train ourselves in business. If we're going to get a new computer system, we go out and we spend millions of dollars in a company, and we train people how to work it, and we want to become good at golf or swimming or tennis or backgammon or anything that you can think of. We know that we got to go out and we got to practice and we got to train ourselves. We train ourselves and we ignore our mind, which is 99% of who we are. We just completely ignore it. Like there's no training available for our minds. And we can all do that. I've really learned how to do it myself. No one ever taught me. You know, when I used to teach at a university, I taught in Berlin for half a year. There were 70 students in the class. And I would have the first student introduce 
themselves and their name. Then I would have the second student introduce the person who was just introduced and himself, and each time I would repeat it. Then I'd have the third student introduce the two that he had just introduced plus himself, and we'd do that for the whole class. By the time we got to the 70th student, they had to introduce everybody in the class by name, and I would then repeat each one of them. And I just had a very simple technique for doing that. It was just like concentrated effort on making my mind remember 70 people's names in an hour and a half. Now, I wasn't doing it to waste an hour and a half. This was a class on teaching people how to identify neurotic behavior in people. And it's like what I wanted to do was to teach them that they could do things with their minds, just like their patients do, that they never thought of, that they never even dreamt were possible for them. Two weeks later, three weeks later, they would have like 80, 90 percent recall. And by the end of the fourth or fifth week, everybody knew everybody's name in the class, and they had all trained themselves. And most people go out there, and they're introduced to somebody, and they say, hello, my name is Wayne. They say, what would you say your name was? <laughs> they can't remember one person's name in one minute. And they think that, oh, I have a poor memory. But it's because they don't train. Well, the mind can be trained, and meditating is a perfect way to do that. And there's a wonderful world in there, <laughs> in your mind. Quieting your mind means that you're no longer susceptible to all of the external influences that are around you. I'm always amazed when I watch the U.S. Open tennis championships that are played in New York right near LaGuardia at how the players are able to continue playing with jets going on overhead. And yet, when I am really completely involved in a tennis match, I've had people where I've played, I've had jackhammers going next to me, and my opponent is going crazy. They have to go over there, and I tell them, I don't notice it. My concentration is on the ball. And I don't hear that lawnmower going off or the jackhammer going or the airplane going on overhead. We can train ourselves to do that. The people who are really good at any game or any activity that requires concentration know how to do that. Well, we all want to be able to be better at that, and we don't want to have our minds occupied, particularly with worry and anxiety and stressful kinds of things. So you have to learn how to focus your mind, how to get focused, and keep yourself from creating those kinds of thoughts that are always impinging on your consciousness. Miracles are available there. You talk about surrendering. I meditated for a long time. It's like there would be a light. I would have this light that I would create. And it's really interesting that you can create a light with your eyes closed in a dark room. So you don't really need your eyes to create light. You need your mind to create light. Your mind can create light. And all of us do it in our dreams. We can create a color in our dream without any light. <laughs> so that our minds are capable of producing that, and our minds can create smells, and we can create sounds. We do all of that in our dream, and that's just a pure thought state. So what you want to do is get to that pure thought state. I use a technique that I just invented myself. It just worked for me. I close my eyes. I only have to do this for 10 or 15 minutes, and it's the equivalent of getting eight hours of sleep, literally. And it's the most exhilarating, energy-producing, feeling like I can conquer anything, knowing that I can't be defeated attitude that just comes from peacefully quieting my mind. And if I'm giving a speech and I give a break, oftentimes I will just go back into a room and re-energize myself. And it's literally like getting a full night's sleep, only I'm more energized, because oftentimes you're groggy after sleeping for so long. And it's really just closing my eyes and creating like a pastel field. And my mind can create any color that I want, which is just so astounding. You think you need your eyes to create it, and you don't at all. And I create that field. In my mind, I put a barrier around that field, and I won't let anything into it. And any thought that tries to penetrate that barrier sort of bounces back, and it takes about two or three minutes to get yourself, like, totally relaxed. Now, I don't really believe that anybody can just not think at all. I think that's part of the trap. It's part of the human condition. That thinking always goes on. Even thinking about not thinking is still thinking. But you don't have extraneous thoughts. You get, like, single-minded. And this is wonderful, wonderful training for anyone. And so it's like as you do that and you just won't let a thought in and you won't let a thought in and you won't let a thought in, you become very, very, very relaxed. And then you can create whatever you want. I create a light. It's like a white light, a spotlight, way off in the distance in my mind. And I approach it. I just keep coming closer and closer and closer to it with this pastel feel keeping any thoughts from bombarding it. It's amazing how at the beginning, when you first start this, how it's hard to go five seconds. Five seconds without having some kind of thought and pinion, boom, all of a sudden you catch yourself doing that. Then you get to 10 seconds, you get to 30 seconds, and before long, you can do a couple of minutes. And as I move and move towards the light, for many years, I was afraid of the light. I would get close to it, and I knew that if I went into it, that something was going to happen that I didn't know. And so I'd always sort of approach it, and then I'd come back. 
And then I allowed myself just to go through it. I just surrendered to it. I said, I can handle it. I created miracles <laughs> in that space for myself. And in the world that I came back to when I left the meditation as well. I do that on a regular basis. The result, the peacefulness, the harmony, the serenity, the energy that you begin to get when you just take a few minutes a day, 10 or 15 minutes a day, put yourself into a sensory deprivation kind of atmosphere, a tub of water under a tree in a meadow, and just go into your mind and begin to see the world. And you begin to see, as I said, how slimy your mind is, <laughs> how much stuff you are constantly using that you don't need to, how many bad and negative and worrying and hurtful thoughts that keep impinging on it, keep trying to break that field. You let them bounce off. You let them bounce off. You let them bounce off. And before long, it's like you're only letting harmony in. This is what I believe any one of us can do. Any one of us can only let harmony in. We don't have to let anybody into our consciousness, because all they are is just thoughts anyway, unless they come there with harmony. Now, that's like a commitment that you could make, that if you come with this harmony, discordance, anger, stress, tension, you only get to my form. You only get to the package. But unless you come with love, harmony, serenity, peace, whatever, you don't get to who I really am. You don't get there, because I'm beyond the need to have conflict and confrontation occupying my soul. I just don't need that any longer. I'm gone through the gate. I'm past that. I've gone through the light. I look at that as no longer my need to prove that I can deal with it and handle it. That's gone. I was on an airplane, and we were flying from Miami to San Francisco, and the plane taxied out, and it got to the runway, and there was a light that came on in the cockpit, and the pilot announced that we wouldn't be able to take off. We're going to have to go back to the gate because the stabilizer that takes care of the wing flaps or something wasn't registering as working properly, and we'd have to go back. There's going to be a two-hour delay. Now, my immediate attitude when something like that happens is, you're not supposed to get to San Francisco in five hours, okay? <laughs> that when my ancestors wanted to get to San Francisco from Miami, if they left in September, and if they got there in March, April, they considered that on time. And it was a good trip if half the people were still alive, all right? <laughs> it was very successful. If they could get there, if it took them nine months or a year to get there in wagons and so on, then if it's going to take me two more hours or whatever, and if the stabilizer isn't working on that aircraft in anything that stabilizes anything, I want to go back to the gate, <laughs> okay? I'm not interested in being angry about that or anything. It's a part of surrendering. It's just understanding. I was in first class. The stewardess was standing there, and she said, oh, no. Oh, no. She knew who I was. I had been talking to her. And she said, oh, this is oh, this is what I dread. I said, what's the matter? She said, there's 176 people on this plane. Every one of them is going to say something nasty to me when they get off the plane. They're going to blame me. They're going to blame the airline, and they're going to... I said, but you don't have to let that in. She said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you've got two packages, two suits that are protecting you from anybody coming to you with that disharmony. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you got your uniform. I said, that's one package, and that's over the other package, which is your body. And then both of those are protecting or covering who you really are, which is how you choose to process all of this and how you choose to think and who you really are. I said, each person that comes up by you and says something negative or nasty, you can just let that only be a message to your uniform, <laughs> to your package. That's not me, and you can remind yourself, they're not talking to me. They can't get to me with that stuff. They can't have that. I don't let anybody come to me unless they come with love or harmony to who I really am. So you can just say, well, I'm very sorry, and have a good... And it's like, and you say, well, they didn't get to me, and they didn't get to me. They're not reaching me with that. And sure enough, she stood there and she watched as 176 people got off, and I'd say 150 of them said something nasty to her on the way out. And each time, she just sort of smiled and said, yes, well, it'll be two hours, and she gave them instructions on where to go. And when it was all done, she sat down next to me. She said, that was fantastic. It's the first time that we've ever had a circumstance like this where I didn't let it bother me. I said, you don't have to let that stuff into your life. And it's just like in the meditation, in the field. When those thoughts start impinging on the field, the pastel that you have created, you don't have to let them in. They bounce. And the more you do that, the more you allow yourself the right to have only what you want to enter your consciousness. You just make that choice all the time. I do it all the time. <laughs> when I'm driving and if anybody gives me, I don't take any of that inside. I just say, oh, that's them and that's how they're reacting to my form. But if somebody comes to me with love, with serenity, with peace, with joy, with ease, whatever, then you can have all of me. 
I will respond back with that. So you let in whatever you want. That's what meditating does for you. That's what a quiet mind does for you. It allows you to select what you allow into who you really are without having to be a slave to every single person who's out there and every single action that's out there that doesn't fit in with the way you want it to be. Having a quiet mind in a practical sense is really understanding that what I'm talking about is not just for discussion. It's for application. If you're the kind of person who has your mind filled with 10 different things that you have to do, and that is producing anxiety, stress, ulcers, colds, backaches, headaches, cramps, runny noses, all of the kinds of physical reactions and manifestations of that kind of thinking, then you have to look at how can you just get a blank mind or how can you get a quiet mind? How can you just understand that supposing you're thinking about you got to get to work, you've got this report you got to get out, you got to get your taxes done, you got to stop and get some diapers on the way home, now the kids need to have bananas and they've got dance lessons I've got to get them to, an endless catalog of activities. By using your mind to do that and to occupy it all the time, none of that is going to get done. See, all of that is going to get done. Regardless, if you're the kind of person who does those things, it's going to get done. The question is, how do you use your present moments? See, any time you use up your present moment, or any time that you are thinking anxious thoughts, you're denying the present. You're using up the present moment. Instead of using it up in a productive, peaceful, serene, calm way, you are somehow believing that you can't get through this day or this moment any other way, that if I don't think about it and worry about it and be anxious about it. But the fact is, it's going to get done. Your taxes are going to get done. You're not going to jail. <laughs> You're not the kind of person who's going to opt to just simply not do your taxes. You're going to get the diapers. You're going to get the report done. All of that you're going to get done. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the position that you're in. You would be doing something else, all right? So if you know that it's going to get done, the question is, what's the most efficient and effective and peaceful way to get things done? I use the analogy often of when you're in a hurry, like when your body is in a hurry. That's when you're least effective. And that's when you always drop something. You'll drop the keys, and then you'll start sweating. And then when you start sweating, you find yourself getting more upset. You'll forget something. And you'll walk out the door, and you'll slam the door, uh, and you left the key on the inside. Now you don't have a key. I've talked about when you take a shower. If you rush through a shower because you only have five minutes to take a shower, and you finish, and you take your shower, and then you dry yourself off, you didn't need to take a shower because you're already dirty again. I mean, you're already sweating. You can take the same five minutes and take a shower if that's all you have. And you can do it peacefully. The same five minutes. You can push all of the other stuff out, and you can just relax. And if you've got three minutes, instead of rushing through it, you can just let the water pour. You can experience the water. You can wash your body. You can dry it all off. And when you finish, you're not sweating. And you had the same amount of time. The nervousness and all of that comes from the way that you decide to process. Now, in the physical world, you understand that if you hurry and rush and are filled with a thousand different activities, that you have decreased your efficiency. Why isn't the same thing true in the mental world, in your mind? If you are filling your mind with all of the things that you have to do and you're worried about all of those things and get yourself all consumed with them, then you're still going to be less efficient, less effective, and you're still going to be cluttered. At a moment like that, you put on a tape. <laughs> if you're going to drive, you got to drive. You can't get the bananas and the diapers and the report done and the IRS taken care of in the car on the freeway. You can't do that then. You're driving. So why not be here now, as Ram Dass says? Be here now. Here's some music. Put on a tape. Meditate right there. Don't close your eyes. <laughs> but just, like, push it all out. All of that's going to get held. But meantime, I'm going to enjoy this. My ride from my home to my office is 17 miles. I love those 17 miles. There's a million things to see in those 17 miles. I cannot write my books or get my speeches. I can't do any of that in that time. But I can enjoy all of that. I can be there with it. I can open the windows, and I can let the wind blow on me, and I can experience that and enjoy all of that. And when I get to where I'm going, if I've got to get the report done, I'm now prepared to do it. I'm not working on the report thinking about my taxes or getting the diapers or getting the bananas or whatever it may be. I'm here now in the moment. That's what meditating teaches you. Being here now in the moment, quiet, joyful, peaceful. When you're there and you get your mind trained to do that, that isn't just like something you do for 15 minutes a day just to give you something to do for that 15 minutes. That carries over into everything that you do. You suddenly find yourself slowing down. And the more peaceful you are, the more efficient you are. The more you're in a hurry, the more you're always trying to get someplace fast, 
The chances of having an accident are greater. The chances of you getting there all ruffled are much greater. The chances of your heart rate going up are much greater. Your pulse is going to go faster. Your stomach is going to be upset. None of that is worth it. None of that is useful. Meditating teaches you that you have the capacity to use your mind any way that you want to. And you suddenly begin to see that everybody else out there who's in a frenzy and all upset and worked up, that you don't have to go there. It doesn't have to be that way. I just spent a week on Bali. As we went out across the island, I noticed some really interesting things that were really helpful to me. There was a very, very busy intersection in a town called Denpazar. There was an accident, and a little boy was killed. He was 13 years old while we were there. It happened the first day we were there. There are a lot of accidents there. The roads are real, real bad, and there seems to be a lot of crazy driving. And it's so inconsistent with so many of the people that we met, so many paradoxes there. At any rate, at this very, very busy, busy location where this little boy was killed, the immediate family of the boy went to the accident site, and they placed flowers and burnt incense all around this place, and they sat there in the middle of the intersection for three days, 72 hours, three solid days, praying for the soul of this little boy. And not once did you hear a horn. And not once did you hear anybody screaming and yelling, get out of the way. This was a very, very spiritual place, just unbelievably like that. We went into homes where people had 10 and 11 children, and they had three huts where they would sleep. And I took my children in there with me. They would sleep on these, like, matted floors. And with 11 children in these little huts, there was almost no noise. And there's a quietness about the people. They're really attached to nature. They're very close to God in whatever that means. Every home on the island has a temple. No matter how small it is, they have a little temple. in the back. When you go into the temple, you have to wrap something around your waist to remind you to leave the physical world behind and just enter their only spirit, only thought. My wife and I had almost a spiritual experience of being there, of realizing that we don't need any more. We think we need more. We're always trying to get more. Not just us, but I mean, I'm talking about all of us here in the Western world. We sort of believe that our happiness and fulfillment is dependent upon accumulating more and getting more. And we saw all these people who had so little, and yet they were so close to nature. They were so close to God. It was almost like God was right there with them. Healthy, beautiful-looking people. It was astonishing when I flew out of there. Because when I first arrived there, I had just been on a five-city tour of Australia, speaking to large crowds and all of that, and it took me two days of wanting to leave Bali. <laughs> I'd always wanted to get there, and there I was, and I wanted to leave because I wanted more of the helter-skelter, the rush that I had been accustomed to in Australia, taking me every place, limousines, and having people take care of everything for you, and thousands of people listening and selling books and the whole thing. All of a sudden, all of that was gone, and it was like I couldn't adjust. <laughs> And finally, by the third day, I realized that I've got to stay here. Just stay with it. Just go with it. And that's when I got out into the island and stayed there. It only stayed there a week. Flew out of there, went to Hong Kong for a couple of days, and then flew back to San Francisco. And when I got into San Francisco, I was just struck by what's going on in this country. And I've lived here all my life. And all the time in Bali, not one person did I ever see who was anything other than a perfect, beautiful specimen physically. Not once did I see any, and I saw thousands and thousands of people. I made a point to go into their homes and get way out into the boondocks. When I got on the airplane, I, people were walking by, and most of the people were overweight on the plane. Not fat, enormous, corpulent. Their faces looked flushed, and they didn't make eye contact with you like they did there. They were huffing and puffing in the land of plenty. And you know what it is? It's when you have so much, you have a tendency to look in each other's wallet instead of each other's eyes. That's what happened. It's like it chokes me up just to think about it. We're always looking in each other's wallets. We're always saying, how much do you have? And how much do you have? And how much of yours can I get? And I'm going to get yours before you get mine. And we're a whole culture of people like that. And when you have so many, you can't look in people's eyes. You can't look there and see, you know, the joy and the love and the humanity. And that's all there is. That's all we have. We've gotten past all of that. We would call that country uncivilized. We would call that country barren. And these are like naked savages, perhaps. And yet we could use a lot of that. We really could. We've got to stop looking at each other's pocketbooks and get back to looking in each other's eyes. This has been a Nightingale Conant production 